Good evening. My name is uh, Jerry Sellison. I'm this year's president of the Tewksbury Lions Club. On behalf of the Tewksbury Lions Club, we'd like to welcome you to our meeting this evening. We have, to my right here, we have Judy Petodemos. She's the, a diabetic educator from Circle Health and also a nurse practitioner. She's gonna be giving us a 20 minute presentation on diabetes. So we'd like to welcome you all. Uh, we're gonna start with our standard opening. So first we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance by Loretta Ryan. Everybody please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing. Verse of America, Denise. My country's is a free, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of thy pilgrim's pride, from every mountain side, let freedom ring. <laughs> I just got a text. Bonnie can't make it. So, um, no, John's gonna, which is pretty interesting actually. John's gonna give the invocation. You I got it. You got it? I got one, buddy. I got okay. one. Thank you. Can they edit this down? No, no, we're gonna be good. Pre, pre printed. Could have told me before this, Jerry. It's in here. I just got the text. You just got the text? All right. All right. Invocation. All right. We'll do which one you want to do. Uh, let's do. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the food and, the, and remember the hungry. We ask thee for help and remember the sick. We ask thee for friends and remember the friendless. We ask thee for freedom and remember the enslaved. May these remembrances steer us to service that thy gifts may be used for others. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. Lions toast by in Dakota. Holding hands. Holding hands, please. Ready? Not above you. Not above you. Not beneath you, but I'm with you. Thought of the day, Ron Hall. Here you go, Ron. I thought this was very okay. Thank you. I thought this was very appropriate tonight with the uh, Tewksbury connection to this program. When one door of happiness closes another opens. But often, we look so long at the closed door that we do not see the one that has been opened for us. This was written by Helen Keller. Wow. <laughs> Before we uh, start with Judy's presentation, uh, John Deputat, who is uh, the current secretary of the Lions Club, He's gonna give a brief history of the Tewksbury Lions Club uh, that some people may or may not be aware of. Okay, thank you. Good crowd tonight. Thanks for all coming. Who are the Tewksbury Lions? People may wonder who are the Lions. Is it a business group? A political group? Religious affiliation of some ancient order? Is the membership open to only those of certain income brackets? Is it a gender-restricted membership? Do these lines have a hidden agenda? Who are these people? Hopefully I can answer that. The Tewksbury Lions Club is a to totally non-sectarian, non-partisan, conservative organization. Membership is open to any man or woman with a strong sense of community pride and has the desire to help others. We meet 
7 p.m. on the second and fourth Wednesday of each month, presently at T.J. Callahan's. As the world's largest ser service organization, we exist primarily to serve our community without personal or financial gain and to assist others who are in need and less fortunate than ourselves. As you just heard, during the traditional five-point opening of each event, membership Thank you, Jerry. The membership joins hands saying, not above you, not beneath you, but with you. At this time, I'd like to give you a condensed history of the Lions. Back in 1917, our founder, Melvin Jones, made a proposal to a group of businessmen and friends of Chicago. The idea was that they'd be of service to their fellow man without any hope of personal gain. This resulted in the founding of the organization to be known as the Lions Club. In 1925, the featured speaker at the annual convention was Helen Keller. She challenged the Lions to become Knights of the Blind and to play an active role in the battle against blindness. Today, the words sight and lions have become interwoven and Lions International has become the largest service organization in the world to fight and challenge eye disease. In 2017, the Lions attained their 100th anniversary and celebrate their first the first century of service with various worldwide programs. The town of Tewksbury has a special relationship with Helen Keller and her teacher, Ann Sullivan. Ann spent much of her youth at the Tewksbury State Hospital here in town, where she gained experience and knowledge regarding the blind, which she later expended unto Helen Keller in her, as her mentor and teacher. In the center of our town, on the grounds of the town hall, there is a, there is a statue honoring Aunt Sullivan and Helen Keller. Also, a building at the hospital campus is named after Aunt Sullivan. Presently, the worldwide membership is made up of more than 47,000 Lions Clubs. Uh, in 210 countries within the world with 1.4 million members. Each member is promised to follow the original ideals established by Belman Jones. There's, we have not only been a leader in the battle against blindness and eye-related diseases, but have become to, know, to be known as an active contributor within the community that we live. The mission statement of the Lions International is to empower volunteers to serve their communities, meet, huma meet humanitarian needs, encourage peace, and promote international understanding through Lions Clubs. The Turksbury Lions Club was chartered in November 14, 1954, with 29 members. Although we have a reputation as a fun club, we also are a very hard-working club and have contributed over $400,000 to eye research. In addition, we have bestowed many thousands of dollars to other charities and deserving entities within our town. The Tewksbury Lions have become a major contributor to the Tewksbury Food Pantry. We also continue to award scholarships to Tewksbury resident applicants to apply and qualify. We also sponsor and provide free eye exams via the, the um, recently purchased portable eye screener. And also we have a physician that we are working with now to help out. We raise these funds by way of our annual golf tournament, spaghetti dinner canister to drive, and other activities that we own in the town. So Spree Lions Charities Incorporated is a North Commonwealth of Massachusetts registered 501c3 nonprofit public charity organization. The international model, the Lions is we serve. Presently, we have over 50 members in our club, and they take this model very seriously. So remember, See it once when you see us out there, which you will the day before Easter, collecting. It's for a great cause, so dig deep in your pocket. Thank you very much. All right, without uh, any uh, additional information, I am glad to present uh, Judy Pentadimos from Temple Health. Thank you very much, Jerry, and uh, thank you for inviting me here this evening. Am I supposed to press a button or something? No, come, come up. I think it's on. It's on? Okay. 
I'm not used to a microphone. I usually have a loud enough voice. Um, uh, and again, thank you. Um, my um, mission, uh, just as you have a mission in your work with uh, diabetes and eye disease, my mission is to help stop type 2 diabetes. And I'm going to show you some slides here. And what we know is that prior to a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, you have a diagnosis of prediabetes. And you have many, many years of metabolic changes that are taking place. And if we can pay attention during this phase, we can, according to the National Diabetes Prevention Program, we can actually prevent people from going down the road of type 2 diabetes, which is very costly and um, uh, requires a lot of time and attention out of your day. So, um, oops, wrong one. Let's see. Press the. So the U.S. prevalence, this is an old slide. I actually had this slide um, made many years ago. And so the U.S. prevalence in 2007 was 1.6 million new cases of diabetes. 24 million people were living with diabetes and 5.7 undiagnosed with an estimated 57 million with the condition of prediabetes. The latest statistics we don't even have. This is actually from uh, 2013. So now there are 86 million people with prediabetes. Just today alone, it is estimated that 4,660 4, people will be diagnosed um, it, in, uh, universally. It's a very expensive disease. It takes um, one in five healthcare dollars to treat. And the numbers are climbing and climbing relative to the cost of this disease because medications are expensive and these, the condition of diabetes doesn't go along with just one medical condition. It usually includes dyslipidemia, heart disease, hypertension, obesity, and um, the like. So this, if you take home any message at all from me tonight, I need you to think long and hard about this piece of information because this um, surprised me. A study done found for prediabetes that the fastest growing population, and you can see it down here, down in the bottom it says in adolescence. So in adolescence, Prediabetes, this is children ages 12 to 19 years of age, prediabetes increased from 9% to 23% in 2017. That's huge. When you think about this, a hands, how many people have grandchildren? Yeah. So these are the people that are at risk. And if we don't put them on a prevention course and find out, because statistically, if you have one family member with type 2 diabetes, you are 90% likely of developing type 2 diabetes over the course of your lifetime. If you have two parents with type 2 diabetes, you're 95% likely of developing type 2 diabetes. They leave 5% for lifestyle. You do not have to go down the road that the generations before you went down. But I will tell you something. I've been doing this job since 1993, and what I am seeing is in families with type 2 diabetes, generation after generation, they are getting diagnosed younger. So my personal history, my grandmother developed her diabetes when she was about 75. My father developed his when he was about 57. My sisters developed it when they were in their 30s to 40s, and I now have nieces in their 20s that have type 2 diabetes. I am on a personal mission to prevent type 2 diabetes. I actually have to practice what I preach because if I don't, I will have diabetes. So just think about it. If you have this condition, the generations that are following you, 
need some help and they need help in prevention. And that's my biggest fear because when you think, when you think, my grandmother got her diabetes late in life. She didn't have many years to develop a bad heart and bad kidneys and eye disease. What about these kids that are going to have type 2 diabetes in their late teens or 20s and all of those years of potential for the comorbid conditions? How long are they going to have to fight off heart disease, blindness, and kidney disease? So, so this is really something that we have to pay attention to. And frankly, I'm a little bit surprised that even nationally it's not getting more press. Um, than it th and it should. So, oh, why isn't it? Oh, why aren't we moving? We were moving. Oh. Okay. So where to start? I think the uh, most important thing is to start by knowing what your family history is. And um, you know, back in the old days, nobody wanted to talk about any of their medical conditions. Um, nowadays, uh, people can look up anything on the internet, but I uh, hope that if you do look things up on the internet that you'll back it up with getting a doctor's uh, evaluation and a diagnosis that you don't diagnose yourself. I brought some of these. This is really good to keep a track of your um, health records and uh, be prepared for your doctor office visits. And um, if you, you want to take some of this stuff, I'll have it up here afterwards. Certain conditions run in families. I've already alluded to that. Um, know what your risks are and the health risks of the generations before you. Keep your health files up to date and also be proactive rather than reactive and get evaluation and testing based on your risks. So I told you before about metabolic syndrome and this is what it is and we're going to go through all of these one by one so that you have an appreciation of what you should be evaluated for and what the levels are. So the very first progression of prediabetes is the state of um, overweight and inactivity because you can even be of normal weight but if you're excessively inactive you can still develop a condition called insulin resistance. So I caution you when using a BMI because a BMI uh, doesn't take into consideration um, many uh, factors. So a BMI is basal metabolic index and so it talks about your height and your weight and it calculates out um, a number. If your number is 30 or over, that means you're overweight. The number under 25, you're of ideal weight. So um, having that as part of a regular health screening is an important number to know. But really, you just have to look at somebody to know <laughs> if they're having a problem with weight. And we call it all kinds of things, muffin top, um, love handle, spare tire, whatever you want to call it. If it's there and you can see it, you need to start doing something about it. And so what is the problem? The problem is what I uh, mentioned before, this condition of insulin resistance. So this is a, a joke from Malol's son and I am just amazed because who thinks of these things? Who thinks of these? Can everybody read that? No. Oh, it says, so this is my height as I as a kid and these are my width as an adult so it's easy to put on and hard to take off so insulin resistance really involves the fat cells the fat cells stop absorbing the sugar efficiently and there are actually some medications on the market that will help you grow new fat cells in order to lower your blood sugar I'm not a fan of those, but they're out there. And so once the cells stop absorbing the sugar, the blood sugar rises. The pancreas, the organ that sits in the middle of the stomach, produces more insulin. It says, hmm, we're having a hard time getting the blood sugar under control. I will help out. I will make more insulin. 
The problem with making more insulin is that insulin, whether you produce it yourself or you inject it from a prescription medicine, insulin is a fat storage hormone. The more insulin your body has to produce to get the job done, the more insulin you have to inject to get the job done, potentially the more fat you will store. And the other problem is, is that insulin resistance causes a degree of fluid retention. So it's a vicious cycle. The bigger the body, the more insulin you need, it's supply and demand. The more insulin you need, the more fat you store, the more fat you store, the more insulin you need, and we have to break the cycle. So after stage one, which is insulin resistance, you start to progress to stage two. And stage two is impaired glucose tolerance. Impaired glucose tolerance means that you eat a meal, and after that meal, your blood sugar is much higher than it should be. But we don't see this because nobody's testing this. And, and even in, in routine uh, screenings, they don't test for post-meal high blood sugars. The criteria is based on a fasting <coughs> blood sugar, and fasting blood sugar doesn't fail until much later in the disease state. If your doctor were on the lookout and saw that you had a little <coughs> extra weight and your triglyceride levels were high, he or she could pretty much suspect that you were starting to have a degree of insulin resistance and you were on the slippery slope. But often they don't. They look at triglycerides and say, oh, it's genetic. Your, your father had them and, um, and that's all. So um, putting the pieces of the puzzle together is really important. Fluid retention causes the blood pressure to rise. And when the blood pressure rises, you start to feel a little fatigued. So you're pooping out halfway through the day. Two o'clock, you really want to lay down and take a nap. Progressing to stage three is in our impaired fasting glucose stage. This is when you would go to the doctor and get a fasting blood sugar, nothing to eat or drink for eight hours before, and the blood sugar would be over 100. Really want that fasting blood sugar less than 100. If the fasting blood sugar is 100 to 110, you have pre-diabetes. Dyslipidemia, elevated cholesterol, um, uh, cholesterol values, it really should be monitored. Cholesterol needs to be kept low. Cholesterol is an animal fat. It um, most comes to the body by red meats and, and uh, skin on the chicken and unhealthy fats. Elevated triglyceride levels. Triglycerides are carbohydrate-driven and alcohol-driven. So if you can concentrate on reducing your, <laughs> reducing your carbohydrates and alcohol consumption, you usually can improve your triglycerides. A low HDL, L, um, HDL is the happy little housekeeper. We want that number high. And having that number over 45 is a great cardioprotective benefit. And the LDL starts to become high, and we really want that number to be low. So there's an inverse relationship. Dyslipidemia means that your HDL is too low and your LDL is too high. And the LDL, the lousy lipid, lays down an awful lot of plaque in the vessels, as do triglycerides. So a diagnosis of prediabetes comes if you have a fasting blood sugar of 100 to 125. 126 is actually a diagnosis for diabetes if you capture that on two separate occasions. A random glucose, that means any time after you've eaten a meal, a blood sugar over 140 to 199 is prediabetes. And an A1C, which is a lab test that reflects a 90-day blood sugar number, anything over 5.7 to 6.4 is prediabetes. If you're under 5.7, you don't have any medical condition relative to diabetes yet. Doesn't mean you never will. And anything over 6.5 is a diagnosis of diabetes. So prevention. 
And I'll dance through all of these because these are all uh, very easy to say, sometimes a little difficult to implement. So <laughs> cooking at home. The best reason to cook at home is because you can control what goes in the food. The more freshness, the more um, uh, natural, the more nutrition. It also allows you to concentrate on restricting your sodium intake and to um, add about sodium intake, sodium intake is a learned habit. You learned to do this. Babies are not born enjoying the taste of salt. So anybody that likes salt, somebody taught you to like salt. So getting it out of the diet is a slow and steady process, but something that everyone should do. In fact, the American College of Cardiologists said that anyone consuming an American diet that is over the age of 50 should restrict their sodium intake to 1,500 milligrams maximum per day. And the DASH diet that's been around for a long time actually says 2,000 milligrams a day. So the, the um, recommendation now is less than 2,000 and as close to 1,500 as you possibly can get. Fat's also an acquired taste. Babies don't like fat. And so if you're having a hot diet that's high in fat, you like fried foods, you, you, um, you know, if chicken has to be fried, uh, so fish has to be a fisherman's platter, um, you learn to like that. That's, that's not um, something that uh, comes naturally. The best reason for cooking at home, though, is to control the portions. Because when you eat out, you tend to uh, I paid for it, I'm going to eat it all, whether I'm full or not. And so um, controlling the portions automatically results in controlling the calories. So next thing I'm going to talk about, eat by color. And so my doctor said I should eat more greens, so I went on a diet, right? The more colorful the food, the more health benefit. In fact, there's a doctor out of Dover, New Hampshire, an endocrinologist that has written a book, Eat by Color. More antioxidants, more vitamins, minerals, bioflavonoids. There's some good indication that purple potatoes, and I've never had a purple potato, but I hear they're out there, can actually result in lowering of your blood pressure. And spinach and broccoli can reduce wrinkles on your face, especially under the eyes. So, increased fiber. Fiber is really important, um, pro provides satiety, lowers your uh, bad cholesterols, um, comes in fresh fruits and fresh vegetables and grains. A high fiber serving is anything that has more than three grams of fiber per serving. So when you pick up and your loaf of bread says one gram of fiber per slice, that's not much. So fiber grams 25 to 30 every day. You can achieve that with um, kidney beans have 14 grams of fiber, an apple 3.3, and pears remarkably have the most fiber. In fact, a pear has more fiber than Metamucil. So anybody that's having a little problem with constipation can really get a lot out of a fresh pear and a glass of water following it. So limit fats. Really keep the total fat grams to less than 65 grams a day, and especially, especially avoid the unhealthy fats. I have listed some of the fats up here, but um, just mostly avoid anything fried. Even if it's fried in a healthy oil, it's not a good choice. And look for these products, because all of these products have been reviewed, scrutinized by the American Dietetic Association or the American Heart Association, and these labels that come on the foods really can um, uh, be beneficial if you just take the time going through the stores. I know Hannaford's has a whole um, guiding star, this up here by Hannaford's, and the more stars, the healthier the food product is for you. So. Um, 
I have more slides, but I was told um, uh, uh, that we would talk uh, for a half an hour, and I'm right to the end of my half hour. So does anybody have any questions they would like? Yes? So we appreciate the beauty tips, so I'm going to put some Venetian broccoli on my face tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but I was going to ask, have there been any studies done about why um, people are getting diagnosed young or younger? Is it lifestyle, genetic? It actually, so you bring up a very good question. And she asks, is there a reason why people are getting diagnosed younger and long younger? Is it lifestyle? Is it genetics? Is it? I think it's a, um, a combination of things. Um, none of us, I don't care what we're doing, work as hard as the generations before us work. Um, it's actually hard to find anybody that busts a sweat in a job because even construction is now push a button, hydraulics. Um, and there are people that work much harder than others, and I always say to them, thank goodness, because your diabetes would be much worse if you had a sit-behind-the-desk job. Um, I think, though, that the, um, the, the change in our, our uh, lifestyle, um, I a actually think that this uh, texting and computers and all of that is not healthy. Um, uh, uh, the food... Um, somebody told us that Cheeto Frito Nacho Dorito is, is, is healthy for us because it's on the food shelf. Um, it's, it's, it's a bunch of things. It's, it's why do they uh, take uh, the fiber out of the food and sell it back to us in a jar called, you know, uh, yeah. wheat germ? It, they've made a lot of the foods uh, just unhealthy over time, and and we're a society that you know there's there's food on every corner, uh, and it, we live in the United States, and for most of us it's it's reasonably priced and uh, and it's plentiful, and <coughs> and and they've supersized us, you know the size of a muffin. If you if you go back to what really is a of a healthy serving size, most of us are eating twice that. Um, uh, when you look at a Dunkin' Donut muffin is actually two servings. The cap is one and the base is another. And yet we only ate one muffin. And so I think it, it's that um, a lot of sit down time, um, a lot of discouraging um, even kids from going out and doing anything, a society. It, how many here as a kid left the house in the morning and didn't come back till the streetlights were on? And we did that all the time. But now, and how many people here have grandkids that have their nose in a computer <laughs> and you hardly can carry on a conversation with them? And this it's going to sound strange, but think about this. We started on fours, and eventually we walked erect. And the more we're in front of a computer, and the more we're on the phone, and the more we're sitting doing nothing, I have a feeling, we won't live to see it, but I have a feeling that eventually people are going to go back down. <laughs> so just obviously I'm being foolish here but but it is it's it's something that we have to and many people from computers have terrible pain in their neck their shoulders eyes eye dry eye um, so we really need to get up and and get going any anything else I think there's been so much more education now though as time goes by on health benefits and I think corporations are getting into that as well they are Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And so I absolutely agree with you. I do. And in the course of my week, how many people come to me and have a gym membership taken right out of their paycheck or their credit card and they have not set foot in the gym in months? And I say to them, how can I get a gig like that? Just give me <laughs> the 
of money and don't show up. But really, it's true. It's like the, you got, don't even get a gym membership. Take a walk. Stand. When you're microwaving your lean cuisine or whatever it is you're eating in front of the microwave, two minutes and 33 seconds, stand there and do this for two minutes and 33 seconds and don't stop. Take advantage of those little missed opportunities to do something physical. If you have a desk job, how much can you do standing that you otherwise do sitting? You burn more calories standing than you do sitting. Answer the phone, never, ever. If the phone rings at your house, never take another phone call sitting down. You're talking, you're walking while you're on the phone. I don't know if many people still have a phone attached to the wall anymore, <laughs> but you can, you can do a 20 minute talk with your sister and put on quite a few um, steps on your Fitbit. <laughs> and, and I'll end there, thank you very much. I do have handouts if anybody's interested. Support group and um, an evening out. Do, do you want them to come up and take, or sure, do you we'll, want them? We'll, we'll, here, here was one second. So uh, on behalf of the Tuxedo Alliance, I would like to thank Judy for her presentation. Nice job, yeah. Judy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So just a couple of plugs, if I might. A uh, week from today, April 17th, from 11 a.m. until 3 p.m. at Wamaset Lanes, we are going to be doing a vision screening. Uh, our focus right now for next week at Wamaset is basically for the youngsters of uh, Tuxedo community. We'd like to invite everybody who was interested in getting their eye checked to come on down to Wamaset Lanes. And you are more than uh, welcome to do that. And that will be free, by the way. There's no charge for that. And uh, the only other thing I can mention right now I'm going to put a plug in for is on April 20th, the day before Easter, the Tokesbury Lions Club will be doing a canister drive at both market baskets. So, uh, And if you uh, have any interest in joining us, <coughs> excuse me, you're more than welcome to come to our next meeting, which is April 24th at 7 p.m. here at T.J. Callahan. So you're more than welcome to join us. And on behalf of the Tokyo Alliance, uh, thank you very much. Um, this is a, I'll, I'll leave these here. This is a type two diabetes risk assessment. And if you already know you have type two diabetes, Give this to somebody, a friend, a relative, a grandchild, and have them take the risk test. And um, support group information, um, a diabetes evening out that the hospital is um, promoting, and uh, the other stuff I'll just leave here, some information about type 2 diabetes, and um, you can take what you want. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.